And I'd like to welcome everyone here. I'm, my name is Dave Hull. I'm kind of the substitute host, host for the night uh, for Sean Slade, who is the program chair. Sean travels a lot. He's in, in Florida and wasn't quite sure if he would be back to his hotel room. And then does he have internet connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I'm going to sub in for him tonight um, and welcome all of you. We, you know, Butch was nice enough to invite a lot of his, his friends and as guests tonight to sit in. So I know that I see Tom Laux. Tom, who is, a, is I think currently the president of Mile High Wildlife uh, Photography Club in Denver here. And I think Tom has actually judged for us a few months ago. Um, Philip Witt, Philip Witt out of New Jersey and his wife Becky were invited. I don't see them at all, but they may join us after a while. Cheryl Opperman, who was our judge last, last month, um, wonderful person. And then Haida Stover, who's out of California, I, I learned, who's the director for the PSA study groups and is good friends with Butch. And then there's another woman by the name of Colleen Riley. I, maybe Colleen will join us as well in a little bit of time. So there doesn't seem to be any people that have uh, joined us from outside looking to check us out as well. But just want to say a few words. I mean, Butch Mazukan and, um, and Cliff Stockdale are the, the co-chairs of the competition. And we're going to have our competition meeting probably, hopefully, live if this all goes well. And we'll continue having a hybrid uh, meeting on both Zoom and in person here at the Lone Tree Civic Center. And hopefully on July 28th, the, the topic that both Cliff and Butch have, have designated this for this month is action and adventure. And there's a good description that's on our website. The key in this, guys, is the capture and convey motion and energy. So action and adventure. So keep that in mind as you're, as you're working on your images. We, we've gone away from, from encouraging people or even allowing people to, to have open competition or open images for competition. So you can no longer submit images of your cat or a rock. We want action and adventure. So please keep that in mind and such. So we kind of had a snafu a little bit with, uh, with our speaker tonight, which kindly stepped in and, and is going to be presenting what you need to know before your African safari. And one thing before I go too much further, I do want to welcome back Tom Pauls, who, who was a member here and stepped away for a little while. Uh, he mentioned that his timing, I guess this is through Carl, he mentioned that his timing is um, is 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 good simply because he's he and his son are going to be going to Africa. So I think he's got a front row seat and he'll be taking notes and probably calling Butch and and wanting to get a, a few extra tidbits. So so the last thing that I have is oh, I guess two things. I think that there's a the Lone Tree um, show image show is still going to go on through the 18th of July. So I would encourage everyone to go. So there's a few more days left. And I think there's some of our members. I know that uh, Gwen Patton, Oz Feniger, uh, Sean Slade, I think are the only three people chosen, I think. Oh, Dominic, I, I wasn't aware that Dominic uh, had, had images as well. I'm sorry for the oversight, Dominic. And then I think uh, a former member, Scott Wilson, has I think several images as well in that. So I would encourage everybody to make the, the, um, you know, the trek down there and and enjoy that show and support our members. Welcome, Becky and Phil. Appreciate you joining. Uh, good to see you again from New Jersey. So thanks for, for staying up and, and enjoying Butch's presentation. I just wanted to read a little bit about, I didn't, I've known little bits and pieces about Butch. And so when Sean asked me to sub in as the host, it's kind of like, well, what do I say? I know Butch lives in Edwards and I know he's a good skier. And But beyond that, I really didn't know much. So I kind of went on, on, you know, Google and found a great bio of his from the, Va the Vale Daily, which is the, the local newspaper in that Vale Valley. Um, and I'm going to read this to you. I, I was just kind of fascinated because there's so much about Butch that I didn't know. And he's, he's a member and he's, you know, this is important. So, I mean, he's a retired insurance industry executive who lives with his wife, Bobby, in Edwards, Colorado. After retirement, Butch kept busy by becoming a full-time ski instructor for Vale Resorts a commentary writer for Vale Daily and an adjunct photography instructor at Colorado Mountain College in Edwards. Um, and I think Butch still does kind of like a, a couple of columns a month in, in the, at the Vale Daily. Butch attended the University of Dayton in Dayton, Ohio, where he majored in marketing, 
and psychology graduating in 1967. After graduation, he completed U.S. Marine Corps Officer Candidate School in Quantico, Virginia, and was commissioned a second lieutenant before going on to flight training at the U.S. Naval Air Training Command in Pensacola, Florida. He was a designated a carrier qualified naval aviator, both rotary and fixed wing, in December 1968. So then after his flight school, he flew off the USS Guam in preparation for his tour in Vietnam, where he arrived in August of 1969 and flew 421 combat missions in CH 46D helicopters. I, that blew me away. I mean, to fly 421 combat missions, man, my, my hat's off to you. I'm, I'm honored to know you. After his discharge in 1971 from the Marine Corps, he went to work for Liberty Mutual Insurance Company as an account executive and was recruited by Arthur J. Gallagher and Company, the world's fourth largest insurance brokerage and risk management firm in 1977 to expand their business operations in the Rocky Mountain region. He opened the Denver office as a one-man startup when he retired, it was a 65-person regional office producing $60 million in annual premiums and fees. As president and CEO of Arthur J. Gallagher, which had full responsibility for the direction and profitability of all branch operations for 19 and a half years. So I can understand why, Butch, why you're enjoying your, your retirement, well-deserved. And, you know, I, I have always looked forward to your your images since I joined here in, I think, 2013. Uh, it was always a mystery until Zoom of who is this guy a little bit. <laughs> so, you know, Zoom has really opened up a lot of our, our doors and our windows and our eyes to get to know you a little better. So with that, Butch, I'm going to kind of mute myself. I encourage a lot of other, I see most people are muted, so I appreciate that. But uh, it's an honor. I've looked forward to your presentation uh, for it going to Africa. So I'll let you take it over from here. Thank you, Butch. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. That was one heck of an introduction. Um, you know, when uh, oh, I'm having an issue here, there we go. Okay. Um, whenever I talk about Africa, I'd like to begin with an old African expression I heard over there, that if you can travel to only two continents in a lifetime, go to Africa twice. My, uh, my wife and I have been there eight times. We found it the most exciting, fascinating, rewarding travel we have ever done. And my purpose tonight is to give the first time uh, safari goer enough information that they can make informed decisions about the when, where, and how of Africa safari travel. And even if you're not contemplating a trip to Africa, hopefully you'll still pick up a few tips on wildlife photography. Uh, tonight's uh, presentation is divided into two sections, the logistics of Africa travel, and photography and followed by a Q&A. You won't need to take notes because all the slides that you see that are marked with a PDF are available from Carl. Um, you know, the, the first thing that I'm always asked about when discussing African safaris is the cost. But as noted, you know, what does it cost to go out to dinner? There are just so many variables. Nonetheless, after watching this presentation, you're gonna be armed with enough information. You'll be able to discuss the variables with your travel agent or safari operator intelligently. So let's first take a look at our safari destinations. You have East Africa and Southern Africa. And I can't say that one is better than the other. Let's just say that there are very different safari experiences and I'm gonna let you take a minute or two, even though you can get a PDF to go ahead and read through that. Here we go. You know, I take a consensus wherever I go about the best photo opportunities and we all have our preferences, but from every professional photographer that I've spoken with, Botswana, Kenya, or Tanzania are probably your best photo opportunities. Um, you know, the other thing that you have to talk about is your mode of travel. You're gonna go with a tour group, you're gonna do individual travel, or you're gonna go on an, an actual photo safari, uh, a workshop type thing. Our personal experiences, our first trip, our first trip to Africa, we met up with a group in Botswana. We met our guide and five other people in uh, Mon, and we traveled together as a group, and it was absolutely delightful. We got along well. There was no problems. The second year, 
we went to five camps, but this time we didn't travel with, with the group. We went individually and we just hooked up with various people in various vehicles at, at each camp. And it was during the second trip when Bobby and I decided that, you know, maybe there might be a better way of doing it. And that's, and that's why from the third to the eighth trip, we always had private guides and private vehicles. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, you know, what, what you're gonna do, you're gonna get the, all your PDFs or, or all, all these slides with a PDF you'll have a copy of, but, and I'm not gonna read these to you, but I wanna mention these, the, these three items quickly. Three days is usually the ideal amount of time to spend in any one camp. The reason is that's pretty much, you're gonna pretty much see what's in that general area within three days. Number two, if you travel between countries, you will lose a day in transit. There is no way around that. And the third item I just wanna mention is when you do travel within countries, by when you're flying within countries, in, within Botswana, within Kenya, with whatever, you're gonna have a weight limitation on those small airplanes. In Southern Africa, the weight limitation is 44 pounds. East Africa, it's 33. 33 pounds when you have 25 pounds of camera gear is not a lot for a two week safari. To help you with that, now I don't have stock in Scott Vest, but this was absolutely invaluable. It is, I could easily put 15 pounds of gear in there. I, I could put cameras, lenses, I could put all sorts of things in there as, as you can see. So again, it's just something to keep in mind, especially if you're traveling within a given country and you're gonna be traveling by small plane, just remember that uh, weight limitations are gonna be a factor. You know, the other thing that you're gonna to have to talk to your travel agent about is national parks versus concessions or conservancies. Uh, as you can see, there's a big difference between the two. Uh, you know, you can pretty much read that on, on your own. And I'll let a picture tell the story, but national parks can get crowded. Uh, they can get very, especially in East Africa. And these white vehicles you see are the budget safari vehicles. And sometimes they're like flies. Um, and Bobby and I did not travel 9,000 miles to fight crowds or be in traffic jams. And again, so this is budget safari vehicles in a, a national park. You know, having said that, and I'm not putting it down because I've been in a number of national parks, um, even a choice between the two, I would much rather stay in a private concession or conservancy than a, a national park. And I think that picture tells the story. It's just a more relaxed environment. And if you note that bottom picture, I have never seen that happen in a national park. Private conservancies, uh, elephants are very curious creatures and it's not unusual to have them uh, come up that close to a vehicle and actually touch the vehicle with their trunk. Uh, this was our favorite conservancy in Kenya, the Olero Rock. And as you can see, there's not a lot of vehicles out there. You know, but regardless of where you go, and again, I'll let the picture tell the story. Those are five shots taken in five different countries. Two were taken in national parks. You're gonna have a wonderful time no matter where you go to Africa. What you expect. Now this quote was given to me by a woman from South Africa and I'll read it. Africa was once a sea of animals with islands of people. Today, it's a sea of people with islands of animals. And I say that because if you're gonna to go to Africa, I would do it sooner rather than later. Wildlife populations are not increasing. I'll give you a second just to take that in. That was my hearing aid that just fell out. That's all right, I have one good ear. But anyway, as you can see, Africa is changing, okay? And I think you have to manage your expectations. Now, I'm gonna guess that Bobby and I have been on 250, maybe 220, 250 game drives. And, and on a few occasions, maybe a half dozen, we were skunked. I mean, you'd go out in an afternoon and we didn't find a squirrel. I mean, it can happen. You know, five times out of 250, it's not very often, but once again, it's not a theme park. It is the, it is the bush, okay? You know, and as far as, uh, th th there's other things to do in Africa other than photography. And here, once again, I've listed them and you can take a look at them. And I will make mention, I want you to look at number one and number two. And this is where my bias comes in as far as Botswana is concerned, because 
Night game drives and off-road driving were the most exciting things I've ever done in Africa. I mean, chasing wild dogs while they were chasing prey through the bush was just incredible. And again, you can't do that. Night game drives are not allowed, nor is off-road driving in national parks. Um, but it is allowed. Are we getting some feedback? Yes. Well, I could hear something. Yeah, Todd is talking on his phone. Okay. All right. Anyway, so um, I just prefer uh, Botswana for that, but there's a myriad of activities that you can do beyond photography over there. Our experience is that Botswana has the most varied activities, but those are questions you need to ask your travel agent about. You know, here's a shot of a Yokovanga Delta, which is just magical in Botswana, and what a way to get up close and personal with wildlife. Uh, this was in, uh, again taken in Botswana where we went to an aviary. Uh, my wife and I intended a four day safari guide camp and here's Bobby learning how to shoot an elephant gun. And she had never fired a weapon in her life. And look at her grouping, it was better than mine, a little embarrassing. Anyway, there's things to do other than photography here. We were, we were on a balloon ride in Kenya. You can take a look. I think we saw one giraffe. I've had people tell me they've seen thousands of wildlife. Again, you just never know what you're gonna get. The weather over there. Well, the weather, obviously, it's always gonna be milder near the equator. Uh, and you're gonna get a PDF and you can take a look at that on your own and see the rainy seasons, when and where, what countries, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line with the weather is I've known people that have come back from Florida, come back from Hawaii and said that the rain or the weather ruined their vacation. I have never heard anybody say that the weather affected their trip to Africa, ever. And if you get a bad day and you get a cloudy day like this, take a picture. Okay, but the point that I wanted to get across in this picture I think tells a story is it can get chilly in Southern Africa, especially in July, August and September. Uh, and it's not unusual for it to be 32 degrees, 33 degrees, maybe a little ice forming on, on water in the morning and then triple digits by two in the afternoon. Uh, you know, I had to give the, or I wanted to give these packing tips. And again, I'm not going to read it to you, but I'm going to mention just three items, six, 16 and 17. One pair of thick soled shoes and one pair of flip flops is all you really need when you're over there. I highly recommend layered clothing, 60 to 70 degree daily swings in temperature, especially in Southern Africa in the, in the, in the colder seasons, not unusual. And down sweaters, which I think most Coloradans own, are perfect for safari. And I got a photo of this in the next slide. You can ball those up to about the size of a softball. They're lightweight, they break the wind. They're not too hot when the weather warms up, but they are just ideal safari wear, okay? Another tip for you is do not go to Africa without reading The Elephant Whisperer. It is maybe the most heartwarming book I have ever read in my life. One of the best books I've ever read in my life, and it's all a true story. Even if you don't go to Africa, pick up this book, you will not regret it. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about private guides and private vehicles. Um, the advantages of a private guide you get the more experienced guides, newer, more comfortable vehicles, the ability to leave the vehicle when you're in the bush and you determine the adventure. In other words, you decide when you, when you leave camp in the morning, you decide when you go back. Uh, whereas when, when you're with a group, the decision is usually made by the guides. Now here's a shot that Bobby and I, now Bobby and I were just fanatical. A wake up call is at five in the morning. We'd leave camp by 5.30. We would not return to seven at, in the evening. And Ping would bring out with us. He would fix a bush. You know, this was all prepared in camp, but he'd lay out that spread, the bush breakfast in the morning. He'd do the same thing at lunch. And here's a shot of Bobby and Ping uh, just having a cup of coffee after breakfast. It wouldn't be unusual to have a, lion, uh, to have a, uh, a cheetah or a leopard come wandering by. Uh, another thing with private vehicles is you see something interesting along the way, you want to stop, do it. 
you know, here Bobby and I saw the, uh, this elephant thigh bone and decided to get the photograph. The most important thing or the biggest advantage to me about a private guide was the ability to get out of the vehicle when you're in the bush. This will not happen when you're with, with a group. Now you'll notice that there's some water between us and the herd, but still our guide was allowing me to get out of the vehicle to shoot. And that feeling, it's, it's just unreal to be on the ground in the bush with those wild animals. Now, the cost, the cost of a private vehicle, again, I don't know. Uh, when we were going over there, it was anywhere between $350 and $400 a day for a private guide and a private vehicle. But, you know, sometimes you have to look at cost. As I said before, Bobby and I were in the bush 12 to 14 hours a day. If you conform to the camp schedule, which we'll go over, you're in the bush 78 hours a day. So over a three-day period, we're in the bush for 36 hours. The people in groups were in the bush for 21 or 24 hours, or whatever. But anyway, it's just, you know, sometimes it's how you look at things. Um, this was uh, on the left of the images. Uh, we were traveling. This is our first safari. This is the group we traveled with, delightful people. There's Bobby getting into the vehicle. And you can take a look at Bobby on the right side. And I think you can see she's a little more relaxed and comfortable. Okay. You know, the other question that I'm always asked about is what type of accommodations are available? My answer is whatever you want. You can go the luxury route and stay in a tent like this and you can have a luxury chemical toilet. The reason we had this luxury chemical toilet is we were, the tent was right next to the river and we were surrounded by hippos at night. Uh, or you can rough it in a thousand square foot tent and you may even get a private plunge pool and a private deck along with it. But the bottom line is you can pretty much get anything that you want over there. It just depends what you're looking at. With Bobby and I, it was always about the game viewing and the guiding. And on a scale of one to 10, we always stayed in camps that were about a seven out of 10 point scale. But if we had to pay a little more to go to a camp that was a little more upscale because, and because of the game viewing, we would do it. And if we had to stay in a glorified Boy Scout camp to get the good game viewing, we would do that as well. But regardless of what you do, and here we are from left to right, top to bottom, four different camps, four different countries. And I would call each of these about a seven, seven and a half on a 10 point scale. They were very, very comfortable. This particular tent was a preferry in South Africa. Nice tents, open, airy. It was right on the, the, the river. We would see elephants crossing air every day. The thing we didn't like about the preferry camp, just too many people. There were 18, 18 tents in that camp. And this is before breakfast and everybody's not even gathered up. As a quick aside, um, you'll meet some interesting people over there. The fellow directly in front of you with the white ball cap, he had Bill and Hillary Clinton on his speed dial. Long story behind that, but this guy was a character. We wound up sharing a vehicle with him. He was nice enough to put us in his private vehicle for a couple of days. But back to the size of the camps, we just found the smaller camps, more intimate, more friendly, and that was our preference. Here's Bobby having lunch with uh, the two camp managers at, uh, in Kenya. But you can find almost any type of accommodation to meet your needs, your desires, and your pocketbook. Another tip, you'll be waking up at five in the morning. It's mind over mattress. Don't miss a game drive, especially a morning game drive. You know, suck it up and get out there. Um, safari vehicles. This is really, really important. And once again, these are the things I wish I had known or someone had told me before we went. And the two reasons you need to know the type of vehicle that you're going to be in for eight hours a day. Um, obviously comfort, leg room, all that type of thing. But the type of vehicle you're in is going to determine the type of support you can use for your camera. And that is critical. These are the things you need to know before you go. And I never thought to ask these questions. What kind of vehicle are you going to be in? All right. The, we were in 32 different camps. We were never in the same type of vehicle twice. So these are the questions that you have to ask beforehand. Okay. In this particular vehicle, this was in Botswana. 
There were nine people in this vehicle. How would you like to be the middle person in the middle row? Where are you gonna put your camera? How are you gonna support it? Where do you put your water bottle? Where do you put your jacket? Where do you put your pack? You need to know before you go. Like I said, you'll, we never saw the same type of safari vehicle twice. And, uh, but the one thing we always did check out is we always wanted open vehicles whenever possible. And we did. Uh, once we started going to private vehicles, 99% uh, of the time, we were always in open vehicles. So again, what do you want to be in? What kind of vehicle do you want to sit in all day, every day? You know, here's Russ Burden. I think Russ did our February uh, judging. Russ runs his own photo tours. And, uh, and his tours, just like all photo safari operators, or I mean, uh, yeah, the uh, photo tour operators, they will all guarantee uh, everybody their own row. Uh, this was on a uh, photo safari in Botswana. And the reason the gentleman on the right is not sharing, does not have his own row, is he's sharing the row with his wife. Nice guy, he happens to live here in Colorado too. But again, enclosed or open vehicles. You know, here's Phil and Becky Witt. Phil, I think did January, Becky, I think was our judge in April. And here they are on the left with their smiling faces in uh, Tenya, in, I'm sorry, in Tanzania. And on the right in uh, Botswana, and that's where we met. Know before you go. If you are not on a designated photo workshop or photo safari, get photos of the vehicles that you're gonna be in and find out the number of people per vehicle. You do not wanna be nine people in the vehicle like I showed you before. Talk a little bit about safari guides. The safari experience is all about guiding. And we have had some fantastic guides. We've had guides that have taken, or one guide in particular, that took out the Disney people, that took out the Big Cat Diary people, and worked with the BBC. We also had a guide in South Africa. I don't think he could have found a lion in a zoo. Uh, you want to find out beforehand, safari guides come in three, three flavors, certification one, two, or three. A CERT three guide is the equivalent of a college education. It takes at least four years, but you want at least a CERT two or CERT three guide. If yours is gonna be a one, all I'm gonna say is don't do it, okay? Your guides will research, the Bobby was a question box. And if they don't have the answer, they will find it for you. Uh, you talk about guides, three photographers paying good money to shoot the backsides of lions in bad light. And I'm looking at the body language of that guide. Again, it's just something you would not think to ask, but it's something you do need to know. But on balance, they were wonderful. Our, our best experience with guides were in Botswana and Kenya. And again, just look at the expressions on people's faces. But guides will do whatever they can. The staffs in general will bend over backwards to make your safari a good one. Safety. Not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but Every country has their own rules and regulations. Every camp has a safety protocol and all camps have air horns in the tents. Uh, in 32 camps, I think two of the camps were walled or fenced, but it's not unusual to have camps, uh, to have wildlife walking through the camps anytime, especially at night, but they come through at the daytime too. This old gal wanted to join me in the shower and I'll be very candid with you. I felt absolutely no fear when she came up to me. And this was the last image I shot before Bobby grabbed me by the hair and pulled me back into the tent. Travel between camps. If you're, tra if you're close by, you can drive from camp to camp, but most of your travel between camps within a country, that is, it's gonna be in a small plane done like this. You'll notice the lion is off to the side of the runway. Um, I was on a photo safari uh, with Russ Johnson photography, something I wouldn't do again, but it was a 14 of us. So he chartered a plane and this was the biggest plane that the biggest airplane that we saw over there. It was like flying in a 747 after being in those small planes. Uh, interesting. Cause you know, I used to fly and my wife would always tell the pilots that I was a carrier pilot and all that. And every single time they would say to me, Butch, you want to take the controls. They put me in a co-pilot seat 
And every time I would say, I have two things. I have my memories and my dignity. You fly the airplane. Anyway, another quick tip, okay? Tipping. Before we would leave home, we would make out a matrix like this for the camps we were gonna be in and put together envelopes with our tip money. There is nothing worse and you'd see it all the time that people in camp, they're checking out a camp and they're scrambling around, oh, do you have change of a 20? You know, there are no teller machines out there. Um, so we would prepare a matrix like this and we would have the envelopes prepared before we went. We would always carry an extra 250 bucks each in small bills. And if a, a particular guide or tracker did a particularly excellent job, which was usually the case, we would tip them a little more. But at least we had the basics down before we left for home, before we left from home. A typical day on safari. Uh, I'll let you read that on your own because a picture, again, is worth a thousand words. But wake up call is five o'clock. 5.30, 6 o'clock, uh, about 5.30, you meet for uh, coffee, a donut, uh, some rolls or a light breakfast. At about 6, you head off on your morning game drive. You get pretty close to the wildlife over there. You see something uh, interesting along the way, but stop uh, at occasional points of interest. Uh, and it's not unusual to, to get stuck over there as well. Uh, a lot of thorns, you get flat tires. Sometimes you get stuck in mud. In, uh, it, it just depends. But th that's another reason to have a hard sole shoe. Okay, you'd have a mid-morning coffee break about 8, 8.30. Um, and then you would con continue on with your game drive, just seeing what you can see. About 11.30 or so, you return for lunch. This was taken at the Sandibi camp. Tom Lauks was kind enough to give me, give me this photo. I've been at that camp twice. It's a favorite for uh, photo safari groups. And then after lunch is siesta time. Again, especially in Southern Africa, it can get hot. You know, it's 115 degrees, the animals aren't out, believe me, you're not missing anything. Okay, after siesta, it's very British. It's time for high tea before the PM game drive. I did an art safari with my wife, Bobby. So it was just me and the ladies. And you can take a look at the spread. And I'll tell you what, uh, it's hard to lose weight over there. They serve a lot of food <laughs> and they really do a good job. And this is, this, this is a very typical spread of what you're gonna find at high tea. And it's a uh, African safari tradition. Then you're off on your PM game drive. If anybody saw the movie African Cats, I hope someone did, the, the cinematography was absolutely unreal. These are Kali's sons. The average lion, male lion, weighs about 500 pounds. They range between 450, 550. Each of these guys was probably close or maybe even more than 600 pounds. They were absolutely massive. This shot was just, one, this is one of my favorite shots I ever took over there. Each of those, those uh, cheetah cubs is about a year old. They didn't have a clue on what to do after mama dropped it off. And when we sat there watching for about an hour, mama teaching them how to hunt, it was just fascinating. Later on in the afternoon, late afternoon, you stop for sundowners. That's the uh, safari version of happy hour. Typical spread that they'll set up. Okay, now what we would do when we, one year we went with my wife's cousins. So we split the cost of a private vehicle, worked out very, very well. And then you return to camp somewhere around sunset. Upon return to camp, you're gonna clean up a little bit and then stop for uh, a, a few drinks. And then you're gonna have the evening meal. Uh, in, in most cases, it'll be around a boma. Sometimes it's in a tent. Each facility is different. Sometimes uh, the local villagers will put on shows and uh, I will tell you, don't miss them. They are phenomenal. We saw a show that would put the Lion King on Broadway to shame. Done with the local villagers just using sticks and they were imitating animals. It was absolutely unbelievable. That happened in Zambia, okay? When you have a private guide in a private vehicle, you can also opt out for dinner in your own tent. And that's something that Bobby and I did frequently. I would say half the time, we would come back after 13, 14 hours in the bush, we were exhausted. 
I think it's the, the adrenaline or whatever it is, but you're just exhausted. And we would want to come back, shower, have dinner and go to sleep. Uh, it wasn't that we were antisocial, but when we had a private guide, I would say that half the time we would just take dinner on our own in our tent. And then we were up at five the next morning and we were out of camp at 5.15, 5.30. Another tip, keep a written diary. I'm gonna say that again, keep a written diary. If you don't, you are going to forget what you saw and what you did. You'll forget what you did from day to day, believe me. And what Bobby and I would do is she found this place to order albums from England, these leather bound albums. And I didn't want to do an ebook. Uh, so we typed, typed up our notes, as you can see on the right. And I just used the uh, photos from that particular day. And now we have all these albums and we enjoy those safari, we enjoy our safaris all over again. But take, keep a diary. Here a little bit of uh, trivia. You can impress your friends if you go over there with your knowledge of correct collective nouns. I thought number 12 was particularly interesting. And the other thing is, it's a life and death struggle in the African bush. And it's not like what you see on TV. It's not Marlon Perkins, this particular kill. And Bobby and I were not fond of watching the kills, but it's part of life over there. We love the stock, not crazy about the kills, but this kill took 20 minutes. Now here's a shot, those uh, cheetah cubs finally figured out what they were supposed to do. And as you can see, this is a before and after photo of the uh, matriarch of a hyena clan. Wild dogs always go for the hyena's ears. Okay, let's talk about photography. What kind of gear do you wanna bring over there? Don't even think about it. Have never seen one over there. You know, you can read this on your own. You have a PDF if you want it. Uh, my second trip, my camera failed. Since that time, I've always taken two cameras. The other thing I do is now when I go, I've always taken a full frame and a comp frame. It just gives you a lot more versatility. I think the focal lengths you'd like to have over there, 16 to 500. You know, my biggest lens is a 400. So when I put a crop frame camera, all of a sudden I have a 640. I had a teleconverter, I have a 900. So, uh, and then number three, I'm gonna give you some visuals on that, but a bean bag or a camp, or a, it's not a camp, a clamp with a ball or gimbal head works. You have three basic options for supporting your camera over there. Handheld, bean bag, or some type of clamp. This is Cheryl Opperman. Cheryl did our last month's uh, judging. She was excellent. Carol does, uh, Cheryl does uh, her, saf her safaris in May and September. She needs a minimum of three. She'll do private safaris and she'll do ladies only safaris. I've done two workshops, not in Africa, but I've done two workshops with, with, with Cheryl. And if there's someone better, I would like to meet them. She is just tremendous. But anyway, she gave me that photo of her. She evidently supplies beanbags for her guests. Uh, I used the ball, uh, my Manfrotto super clamp mounted on a ball head. Here's me and the ladies from the uh, art safari again. And as you can see with the yellow arrow, I have that Manfrotto clamp and I put a ball head on it with my camera. Uh, after that, I bought a, uh, a gimbal head, a Jobu design, and you can see it there on the vehicle again, mounted on my Manfrotto. Uh, my uh, Jobu is $300. A gimbal uh, tripod head is $600. There is nothing, I've had that for eight years. It, there's nothing wrong with it. It is outstanding and it's half the price. I want you to look at this photo too. And you'll look at the red arrow, which points at that bar where my uh, Manfrotto is hooked onto. With a private vehicle, when our travel agent called ahead, every single camp set up some type of support. I told them what I had and they all set up some type of support for my camera. Again, you're gonna get that with a private guide and a private vehicle. Okay, some photo quick tips. This shouldn't be news to anybody, especially not in this group, but keep your lens changes to a minimum. Uh, pillowcases work fine to cover your lens and 
clean your lenses because it gets dusty, very dusty over there. Don't disturb wildlife and animals don't pose, take the picture. And I mentioned that first one, when I say no cheetah chirps or bird calls. One of the reasons we went to private vehicles is we were in South Africa, we were in the third row of a vehicle and there was some clown in the first row who was making bird calls the entire game drive. We could not hear our guide. He would not shut up. And it was after that, Bobby and I looked at each other and we just said, we've got to do something different in the future. But anyway, here's a dozen tips for your better wildlife images. And the only one I'm going to read to you is the one on minimum shutter speeds, because you know the old story. If you don't, if your image isn't sharp, you don't have a photograph. It's that simple. So I never shot mammals under a thousandth. I never shot birds under one thirty-two hundredths of a second. And if your camera has it, I know it's cheating, but I always use auto ISO, especially when you're panning and you're going from bright to light to, to dark, etc. Okay. Let's talk about it though. Perspective. Shooting low to high usually makes far more interesting images than high to low. Sometimes you don't have a choice like if you're on top of a, if you're on a, a riverbank. You know, in this case, shooting down worked out really, really well when I was shooting this, this herd during the crossing. Uh, but the name of the game is you want to get down low. You want to get down about the eye level of your subject. It just makes for far more interesting subjects. Another maximum photography, you want your subject moving towards you, not away from you. Just much more powerful when you have your, your the, the, the subject coming right at you. You'll notice the uh, left paw of this cub just added that, that paw off the ground just added some life. It, ju it just added some energy to the image, which brings us to my next tip. We're all gonna be shooting on high, high speed automatic. So the image that you wanna to submit to competition is the image with the closest paw off the ground. Trust me, it'll score better. And don't forget you want a subject within 90 degree. We were in a, a we were in a boat at the time, we got the elephant shot on the left, but you want your subject facing within 90 degrees of the camera lens. Direct eye contact. Whenever you can get direct eye contact, it just makes for a powerful image. You're showing animals, let's see. These are all, those males are about new, two and a half, three years old. They're getting old enough now, starting to show signs of manes. Uh, Papa's gonna kick them out of the prize shortly. I was very lucky to get them all staring into the camera. And like I said, I never asked any of them to pose. You just got to get lucky. Not as sharp as I'd like, but, oh, by the way, that, that, that one image back there, and then I, I forgot to give credit for it. That was uh, Russ Burden's. I, I really liked it and I wanted to use it. Um, the other thing, when photographing wildlife, it's usually best to capture the entire animal from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail and make sure you leave some room to breathe. Now, here is an excellent shot of this leopard on the right. It's clear, the cat's looking right at you. You got the pupils of the eyes. You can see the whiskers. It's just a dynamite image. I don't, I don't think it's gonna fare as well in competition as capturing the full animal. Partial animals just usually don't, don't fare nearly as well as capturing the full animal. Uh, this could have been a great image, but the tail was clipped. Movement in action. So you're always looking for movement in action. Again, it just brings images to life. These are those same lions I was talking about before. 
three of Kelly's sons. But again, you want to get movement. And it is a hoot watching elephants use their, use their trunks as snorkels. This image was a uh, compliments of our uh, Phil, uh, Phil Witt, I'd asked him, because I did not have, I, I, I wanted some lilac breasted rollers and I didn't have any, so he gave me this one. He allowed me to use it. Motion blur. My recommendation is practice your motion blur at home before you take it to Africa. Motion blur can make very interesting shots, very interesting photos. I entered a contest in Germany. I wasn't in Germany, but it was a German contest. I won 1,000 euros for this shot. Also very, very lucky to capture this. You just can't believe how quickly, how fast cheetahs are. And these guys were loping. Reflections. Reflections always make fascinating images. I wasn't crazy about the angle or the perspective, but I liked the light and I not like the reflection. And you know what? Whether it does well in competition or not, I don't care. I really like this image. The other thing, and I cheat a little bit, is when I'm over there, when, when I was over there, I always shot a little bit wide. Again, the last thing in the world I want to do is clip off part of an ear, a tail, or a paw. So I shot wide, and then you, if you need to crop in, and actually the cropped in image is the one that I've used in competitions, but I started off by shooting wide. Silhouettes, Africa is just dynamite for silhouettes. Elephants, giraffes, rhinos. Uh, I mean, you can just get some great silhouettes over there. Lemons to lemonade. Well, all your shots are going to be winners. And uh, here's an example. I really like this shot. It just didn't pop. Had my biggest lens, but I liked everything about it. I liked the motion, so I took it in the post. I overprocessed it a bit, over sharpened, a little bit of contrast, decided to use a, uh, a light vignette, and it's done, actually, it's done very well in competitions. Uh, we were at, now, uh, this one I not forget because we had gotten out of the vehicle and I had my wrong camera in the hands. I saw the elephant, I saw the water and I'm going, oh God, I the wrong camera, I took the shot. So when I got home, I added Pixel and Topaz, Gigapixel. Maybe it's not gonna win an award, but I really like this shot. I, I think it's kind of unique. Uh, I, I didn't like the color version of this, so I converted it to black and white and I think it makes a much more powerful image in black and white. The light in this image was just, it, it, it just, it just never worked out in a photograph. So I, I turned it to uh, sepia and this has taken first place in every single competition I've entered it into. You're going to take some portraits and close-ups too. And the key to portraits and close-ups is you have to get the pupils tack sharp. Tack sharp pupils are the are absolutely critical to doing portraits and close-ups. If you stop for a second and look to where the pupils should be with this cat, you can see a very clear reflection of our safari vehicle. I can see it on my screen. I don't know if you can see it on yours, but in both eyes, but especially in the right eye, you can see the reflection of our safari, our safari vehicle. This time, this one, I just, I wasn't crazy about the image, so I decided to play with it in photo, and I like it now. With elephants, it's really tough to get the eyes unless you're right on top of them, but because of their long eyelashes and the way their eyes are set, but you can still get good portraits of elephants. This has got to be the ugliest bird. It's a marabou stork. 
one of the uh, ugly five. And even the ox peckers, you got to get the pupils of their eyes. But I think it was Russ Burden who says, exhaust all possibilities. Okay. You also want to capture animals in their environment. This, I, I just happen to like this perspective. It is something you don't see very often with elephants. Uh, Tom Lauchs, I love this photograph. Tom Lauchs gave me the, or you know, allowed me to use this one. Uh, I, I just love this. And just by looking at the setting, I'd almost guarantee this was taken in Botswana. By the way, those spots on the elephant turned the wrong way are not dust spots. Those were on the elephant. I asked my guide what they were. He didn't have a clue either. He says he thought it was some type of a disease possibly. But again, capturing animals in their environment. And again, you know, the middle of the day, no clouds. The light isn't always going to be your friend. So, so you take what nature throws at you. Babies always make great photographs. Always. The other thing you want to capture when possible is interaction and behavior, especially between species. Once again, this is when they figured out what to do. And sometimes even uh, within a species, there's a couple of lion brothers playing around. <laughs> Lions are fascinating to watch when they interact. Question, why does the male on the right have, doesn't, he doesn't have hair on his horns, but the female on the left does. Can you see that? That's because with males, when they're fighting for control of the journey, they wear the hair off their horns. You can impress your friends with that when you go over there. A little bit of knowledge. Uh, tell a story whenever you can. Unique or unusual photos, always fun. You know, the photo on the left, everybody comes back with that. You know, there's grass in the way, the lion's eyes are half closed, soft. Russ Burden, let me use this one. This is my favorite lion shot of ever. I love this shot. Pupils are tack sharp. It's just such a unique photograph for a lion. I love this photograph. But again, you'll notice down low, pupils are, sh are sharp. Uh, I love this shot. Look at the detail, and that's one of the things, again, that, that you're looking for. This is a young male, I'm going to guess, eh, maybe about two and a half, three years old. And look at the detail on that tongue. This bird was just goofy. And this gal was playing uh, peekaboo with us behind that tree. But you'll find unusual instances over there. And, you know, they're not going to win competitions, but they're fun to take and fun to look at again. This one I am really proud of. Nat Geo featured this ungulate. In a, a, it, was, it was quite a special. It's a wetchway. Mother was a red lechway. Father was a water buck. And it was the only one of its kind in the world. Uh, Animals usually don't crossbreed. You're not. You're. You're, you're just not going to get that in the wild. Uh, but this was the only known wedgeway in existence. 
some lion has probably eaten it by now. But again, I was just really, really pleased that I was able to get this shot. I, this one I got in Botswana. Now, just like anything else, beware of distracting ele uh, elements when you're shooting over there. Okay, take a look at the image on the right. We all know that vertical lines are the most powerful lines in photography. Okay, if you look at the image on the right, see I pointed them out on the left. Once you see them, it is impossible not to see them. So the only thing you can do is take them out and post. But it's so easy to get excited in the moment. You, you haven't seen a lion all day and you see the cat, you got to get the shot. And all of a sudden you get the shot and there's a tree growing out of its back. Just be so careful. Tom Laux gave me this shot. I like this shot. Tom gave, uh, gave me this one too. But again, the first thing that I'm looking at, your eye is always drawn to sharp sharpness and, and light. And again, you know, you look at the clarity in Tom's shots, but my eye goes directly to that cloud. The other thing you're gonna find is regal lioness and all these grasses. It's just a part of nature over there. Be very careful with giraffes. Giraffes and horizon lines just don't mix. You know, this is a better background. There's no horizon line, but it's still a little bit busy. Uh, actually, this one I thought worked out pretty well because I have that uh, clear background. Now this one, I didn't care. When I took this shot, there was about a thousand of these left in the wild. They may be extinct by now. I took this shot about five, six years ago, but you know, something's going extinct. I don't care about the distractions. I'm going to get that shot. Did the same thing with the Saddlebill Stork. Uh, now they're not near extinction, but again, uh, they're always in the tall grass. Wasn't able to, to get a, uh, a clean shot of it, but uh, a shot with a distracting background is better than no shot at all. The other thing to be careful about, again, is thickets and bush and undergrowth. Seldom do they enhance an image. I know it's nature. I know it's part of the background and, and part of their environment, but it really doesn't enhance an image. And I don't care how good or interesting the shot is. I just, I always become aware of the background or those branches and twigs, whatever you have. Rhinoceros especially, they are always in, in the brush and getting good shots of rhinos is tough. Uh, this was the best I could do, the wrong hoof was off the ground. <laughs> but give it a little backlight and wow, you can get a dynamite image, which brings me to my next topic, backlight. Okay, as a wise man once said, it's all about the light. Backlight can just do more, but just do wonders over there. And your photo opportunities are not limited to wildlife. Now, these were taken in East Africa, and your uh, chances of going to a village are much greater in East Africa than they are in Southern Africa. This was a delightful woman. As a matter of fact, I even think she allowed Bobby to hold her baby. She was just a delight. And we visited a couple of villages when we were over there. And you might be familiar with this because I entered this one in a competition. And once again, I just lucked out in getting that shot. And lastly, expect to see incredible skies in Africa. So I want to thank you for your attention. I wish you all safe travels. And before we do the Q&A, I just on a little personal note, leave something behind. The camp staff, gently use clothing, leave it behind. Your flip-flops or keens, leave it behind. I mean, these people have nothing. Small, why well, always, we, we would always bring a half dozen small inexpensive flashlights and batteries and leave them in the, and leave them behind. In the villages, the same as the above, plus colored pencils, ballpoint pens for kids. And we went over there with our grandkids we took two of our grandkids. We brought, I think we brought a half dozen deflated soccer balls and hand pumps. 
These are beautiful people. They are wonderful people. These are the best clothes that they have. This is the very best that they have. And anything that you could leave behind for them, we would do. So anyway, with that, I want to thank you again. And I'm now open for the Q&A. Well enough, Lon. I just wanted to say thanks. I, when I saw this on the program schedule, I thought, man, I just, I can't wait. And you far exceeded my expectations. I'm, I'm blown away by, by not only your images, but you know, what information you provided to us. Uh, a couple of quick questions and I'll, since I'm starting off is, you know, if I were spending this kind of money and spending this much time, it's kind of like, what am I gonna do to back everything up? Am I gonna take a whole box of memory cards you know, am I going to take external drives? I mean, I want to make sure that that I come back with as much as I can. What do you do? What's your backup strategy when you're on a safari? That's a great question, and I should have uh, mentioned that. Um, I took, I still have them. I probably took a dozen cards, 32s, 64s, but I'll be honest with you too. I had one fail on me. You have a, a 64 that fails you've lost a ton of images. So I would back them up. Uh, now I would go with my laptop. Uh, you back them up on your laptop, back, back them up on a, an external drive. And I never erased my memory cards. I just took more than enough. This way I, I knew when I was coming home, I had at least two sources. I had the external drive and I had all my memory cards. Well, thanks for that clarification. I mean, it, it just makes good yeah, sense you know, to, to, have, to have that redundancy to, you know, man, you've gone all that way and spent all that money. It's kind of like, man, I, I want to make sure I, I come back with something. The other thing that I was curious about is you mentioned, um, you know, travel agent. So then how do you kind of hook up with a travel agent? How do they arrange a guide that is that class two, class three? Um, versus me just going on, on Google and, and doing the best I can and kind of hope for the best? That's another excellent question. We found our first travel agent. My wife found it online and she went through a Nat Geo website. Um, I thought the travel agent was good, not spectacular. We changed travel agents the next year. Uh, they had us coming back from the camp that uh, we were d disappointed with. And we finally found a third travel agent who was a uh, wildlife biologist. And we worked with him very closely for six years. And then when I was the uh, photographer in residence, that's why I'm not gonna mention any names, we were given some, some serious misinformation. And that's why I'm no longer a photographer in residence there because I won't use them again. Now, I don't like to plug anybody per se, but I will tell you this. Allie Green was a member in our club. Her company specializes in African safaris and she doesn't blow her horn about that stuff, but that is now who we've used and I've recommended to other people and they have come back to me and they've been very, very satisfied with it. Uh, but a travel agent needs to know Africa. You just can't go to your corner travel agent. You need someone that specializes in Africa because they're the ones that are gonna be able to find out what type of safari guide you have, that it's gonna be able to get photographs of those vehicles. So you know what you're getting into. But I think Ellie is a good place uh, to start. But I'm sure that she's gonna appreciate all, all the yeah. people that you sent to her. <laughs> and so she has that, no yeah, idea I, I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one final question before I, I shut up and, and allow other people to, to talk. I, you know, in your last competition, there was the, the image of the school. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what you and your wife, you know, kind of support in, in the school? I think that that's, that's equally as important than just bringing some flashlights and some deflated soccer balls. But, but tell me a little bit about what you do for that school and, and, and the feedback that you that you've been given by helping those kids. Um, in that particular school, I mean, if you probably noticed that kids are sharing desks, kids are sharing books. And when Bobby and I saw that, and again, you know, I don't want to toot my horn on this, but um, you can't walk away from that. So we contacted the principal there and through our guide who helped us out, 
we just bought their, we bought everybody books for a year. We bought the school's books for the entire year. And I wish I could tell you the feedback that we got back. It was just incredible. And after you see those kids, uh, again, the clothes that they're wearing, those are the best clothes. You know, the other thing, you, you don't realize it. Some of these kids are walking five, six miles. They're passing lions and they're passing hippos and they're passing other wild animals on their way to school. And they've all got these smiles on, 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 on their faces. But anyway, we supported that school uh, for a while. Um, we don't any longer, not since we had the falling out with the uh, particular individual I was telling you about. But we did for a couple of years. And that's why I got that shot. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing. Appreciate what you had done for those kids. That's, that's wonderful. So I'm going to mute myself and, and allow other people to, to ask questions. I'm, I'm sure people are jumping at the bit to ask. Thank you, Butch, very much. Thank you, Dave. Butch, I don't have any questions, but it was a, it was a great job. I really enjoyed it. It certainly brought back memories. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you didn't expect to see that shot of us in Quara, did you? I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> good. Good to see you again, Sean. Becky, hi. No, oh, no one else. Bill, uh, I just, or, I'm sorry, uh, Butch. I just want to let you know that that was an outstanding presentation. I've been planning to go there for a while, so it was very helpful. I'll probably sometime in the future ask you. Uh, it takes a certain you know, questions about this that I, I thought I now now, but then after I think about it a little bit, I might have other questions. So thanks. Yeah, well, uh, again, you, the, uh, I've got uh, 38 or 40 slides in a, a master PDF that Carl has. Everything that you saw, you'll have that information. Feel free to call or email me if I can help you out. I love African photo safaris. <laughs> Great, thank you. Sure. And now we, we'll get- We couldn't videos. tell, Butch. <laughs> Tom, how you doing? It was outstanding. It was really great. I love your perspective on so many different aspects of these trips. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's one of the best programs I've seen in a long time, Butch. It was really, this cliff, it was really, really good. No, thank you. Excellent. I appreciate it. You're my hero in photography, so thanks. <laughs> you, need to, you need to have higher standards, man. <laughs> Well, I guess we're done. Anyone else? You know, just for what it's worth, anybody has my, uh, where you can get my email, feel free to call or email. If I can answer any questions, you think of something tomorrow, I'm more than happy to do it. So again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Butch. Well thank thank you, Butch. Butch, your, Butch your, your email is listed in the PDF I'll be sending out shortly, so. Everybody will have your contact info and be able to, to ask further questions or clarification on stuff. So. Super. Thanks, Tom. Dave, you're going to wrap it up? Well, I was just about ready to, to do that. So your, your timing is good. So I don't see anybody else raising their hand. Or, but I just wanted to say thank you very, very much once again uh, for a, a great presentation and sharing so much of the information with us. And I'm sure that people will reach out to you individually. Um, I know that I suspect that Tom Paul will uh, get, get some <laughs> advice from me, but, but I'm, I'm going to start saving my money to figure out where I sort of go to Africa. So, but, but again, thank you very much. Appreciate you stepping in to do the presentations. Today. So, and with that, I, I wish everybody a good evening, and I'll get this recorded, uh, get this recording edited and, and sent to Carl and, and post. But thanks again for, for all the also the PDF which. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody.